It is Transgender Awareness Week, and while the group that makes up the T in LGBTQ has made strides, the transgender population still faces unique challenges and obstacles, especially in the workplace. A new McKinsey report finds that the group is underrepresented, underemployed, and underpaid. So here to tell us more is Jill Zucker, a senior partner at McKinsey. Jill, welcome to Quick Take. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So I want to start by making sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to language, because this is confusing for a lot of people. And the first page of your report actually tackles this with a glossary. So what does the term transgender include? So part of this is exactly, as you say, Scarlett, about language. And transgender, as we define it in this report, are people who don't identify with the sex they were assigned at birth. What about cisgender then? So cisgender is those who identify with the sex that they were assigned at birth. And so we compare and contrast those two through our report. And we did a survey of populations, 250 people from both populations to try to get to some of the insights that we have today. Okay, so thank you for making that clear first off. So let's dig into the state of transgender people in the workplace because what you found is that they are less likely to be employed and when they are working, they're making less money as well? That's correct. And so transgender people are two times more likely to be unemployed. And even when they are employed, they make up to 40% less money, even when you normalize for college education. And so this really is a state of how do we create more equity and inclusion for this population? But as you said, it's not on the radar screen of most HR departments today, in part because we don't have a language and we don't have a shared vocabulary to even talk about it or comfort with the vocabulary uh, so that we can help these people. Why is it that they make less money? Is, is there, a, are there a number of reasons for that? So the top line here is that 50% of transgender people don't feel comfortable bringing their whole selves to work. And we all know, as we've looked at all sorts of affinity groups, if you can't bring your whole self to work, you can't perform at your best. Why can't they bring their whole selves to work? Well, 60% of them just fear for their safety. And so if you're worried about your safety in the workplace, then you certainly can't perform at your best. Okay, let's, let's dig into that a little bit more because that's one of our big numbers. Nearly 60% of survey respondents cited physical safety as one of their biggest concerns, especially in, in figuring out where they want to work. Explain that a little bit more. What sense of safety? Is it their personal safety just getting around and talking to people and sharing who they really are? Or um, are they working outdoors? Are they working with different kinds of people? Are they customer facing? I just need some more detail here. Yeah, well, it's both physical and mental safety. Uh, 2020, we saw nearly 45 deaths in this community, people who were killed because they were transgender, so hate crimes, if you will. 2021 is on track to be uh, even worse for this population. So there's a true physical safety aspect of it. But then there's also mental uh, health and people here are confused about their identity in some instances, or they're not confused, but they're confused about how they portray themselves in the workplace. And we really need to support this community so they can strive and, and be successful in the workplace. And what you found is that, at least when it comes to the workplace, uh, this community tends to cluster in certain industries and perhaps avoid others. What did you learn? So we learned that this community tends to cluster in food and retail. Uh, there's a safety in numbers there, but unfortunately, they tend to be in somewhat lower paying and lower growth jobs in those industries. And so that contributes to the wage gap. If we could close that wage gap, it's both good for this community, but it's good, good for the economy overall. We, we think that closing that wage gap could contribute up to $12 trillion in consumer spending, uh, which would benefit all of us. I mean, it's a bit of a footnote. Let's focus on safety first, mm -hmm. but then... Uh, there is a greater good here. Yeah, well, there are certain executives who are only moved by the numbers, and that $12 trillion number will certainly get their attention. McKinsey is a management consultant giant. You guys streamline and optimize processes for companies. So when you produce this kind of research and these findings and you show it to clients, how do they turn these findings in, into action? What do you suggest to them? So I think part of this is setting the foundation. 
And this is not a topic that's been on the radar screen of most, most HR departments. You know, we talk about the community of LGBTQ plus as an aggregate community. This is one of the first times we said, actually, different parts of that community need different support. And so that was just eye-opening in some of our client conversations. And then we talk about what do you need to do to support the transgender community in your workplace? Well, let's start with not having gender as a field in the application process. Let's ask people to have both their preferred names as opposed to their legal names. We, we hear from transgender uh, colleagues in the workplace and say they get outed at work because they get their legal name is what get you, gets used. That's what's in the HR systems. That's not what they prefer to be using. And that's not how they want to be identified by. And then they deal with microaggressions of people saying, oh, you're so believable. I would never have known. Well, that's their choice, whether or not to communicate that. They shouldn't be outed by an HR system, if you will. Yeah, so these solutions sound really reasonable and sound like they don't necessarily need to be a heavy lift. Do corporate executives and HR departments see it that way as well, that this is something they can implement really quickly? I think so. I think there is a desire to be more inclusive in the workplace generally. We've seen that across populations. I think the goal of this report was to create awareness and the language to do so. I think the next step here is how do we create trans-friendly benefits? People don't feel comfortable asking the question of an HR department, but we talk about family-friendly benefits. We talk about egg freezing and fertility, and we're out in front of some of those things in the recruiting and the hiring process. Let's also talk about uh, trans-friendly benefits and not make people ask about it but have those things available at the outset so people feel like it's a workplace that will be inclusive and understanding. What are some examples of trans-friendly benefits? Well, it's both the mental health, but also the physical health. People are going through hormone replacement therapies and changes, and so making sure that those things are part of the benefit packages is an important piece of the puzzle here. I know McKinsey publishes an annual Women in the Workplace report, and, and you mentioned that this finding, this report on the transgender community is a first. Uh, this is something that you hadn't really delved into before. So I'm just curious as to what catalyzed this closer examination. Was there anything in the Women in the Workplace study that prompted you to take a closer look at the transgender population? Yeah, well, Women in the Workplace, as you likely know, surveys over 300 companies uh, across the corporate America in the US. And we started to look at the respondents and there we asked people to identify their gender and we give a very expansive definition of gender for people to select. And we started to see some of these nuggets around safety and inclusion and the ability to bring your whole self to work around the microaggressions that I shared. And you know, we weren't sure if there was something there or not. We went to our own trans community at McKinsey and started to ask folks, is there something here? And that prompted us to, to dive deeper. So in fairness, we didn't set out to write it, but as we saw the insights, we said, let's dig a little bit deeper. And, and we got to this report and we're, we're really proud that we put it out. We're also proud of the response that we're getting uh, in terms of people responding on social media and the like. Yeah, tell me a little bit more about that because it's not often that you get so many personal responses um, to the reports that you put out. What are people saying to you? People are very appreciative. I mean, we've just put the report out, as you know, in Trans Awareness Week. We've had over 15,000 uh, looks on, on LinkedIn and elsewhere. I've personally received a number of messages from trans people in the workplace thanking us for doing the report, asking to connect one-on-one -on -one about their experiences. And so, you know, it's, I publish reports often. I, I don't usually get this type of one personal outreach or uh, certainly this level of uh, views on these topics. So this is really a first and something that we're proud of in that sense. You definitely hit a chord there. Jill, thank you so much for sharing uh, the results of this report for uh, with us. Jill Zucker is a senior partner at McKinsey & Co., of course, talking about the transgender uh, community in the uh, firm's Transgender Week uh, examination.